slet ikke så sur. Lord, we do not want to bow our heads only. We choose to bow and we want to bow everything within us before the Most High. And we want to say with everything that is within us, Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord for he is good. And his mercy endureth forever. We thank you Lord that we can be here this morning under the covering of your blood your mercy and your mercy and your grace working within us with your truth always present we pray Lord work in us and balance out our scales so that we may be able to discern to understand to have insight in your sovereign rulership, in the midst of our daily events, in the midst of what has happened with us in this week, and in the midst of this moment, and in the midst of the next moment, that we will embrace the fact that your sovereignty has got no beginning and no end. Blessed be your name that you have provided a lamb, your lamb. You are the lamb so that we can in this day, in this moment, Be free, free from guilt, free from condemnation, free from being condemned unto everlasting death. You give us eternal and everlasting life. In Jesus' name, amen. Somewhere this morning, I actually stood up earlier than other Sundays. And somewhere this morning, my wife knocked on my door. And I, didn't, I, I was saying, who was it? Not realizing it was she. And somewhere I lost it an hour. I don't know where I lost the hour. And she said, it's time. I said, it's impossible. We've been dealing with the theme of spiritual warfare. I personally think it's a, a theme that's been taken way out of mostly, many times, way out of its context and it's truth, but there is definitely a spiritual war going on. We've been dealing with this theme quite a few weeks now, and I would just like to start it with this way, or this way, or this way, saying that if you've been born again, you are born again into his kingdom. You are born into a name, because a kingdom has got a king, and a king has got a name. And that you have received a new name.
And you were baptized, and if you hadn't been baptized, you need to be baptized, according to the word of God, into the name Yeshua Moshiach. It is a four square name. Yud. Hey. Va. Hey. In previous teachings that I gave, we'll explain how, where does this come from. God works with us turning the wheel of experience or the wheel of moral development or the wheel of choices where you need to make a choice. And things happen with us contrary to our grain, contrary to what we would like it to happen. Yes, and sometimes God turns the wheel clockwise. When he teaches us from his word uh, certain principles. So when we were born again, we were born into the kingdom. And this explanation we get uh, uh, repeated in the word of God many times. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, it's like a field. He refers to a four square field. When the Hebrews were taught how to plow their lands, they were taught to plow their hands in a square and to harvest in a circle and to leave the corners for the poor, the stranger, the widow, or the fatherless and the widow, where they could go and gather seed and food. When you and I turned to the Lord Yeshua Moshiach, Jesus Christ, and we bent our knees before him, the way that we were born again is because we've laid down our ownership of ourselves. And we've taken on a new ownership and we've said, you be my Lord. I want to step down from control, wanting to control circumstances and people and things, wanting to have the control inside of me. And I want you to come into me and to control me from inside. That is called born again. So you've laid down and I've laid down my likes and my dislikes, my what I expect and what I don't expect, my ambitions and my plans, I lay down. The moment I take them up again, that is what the word says when I start rebelling against the king and the Lord and the master of my life. His mitzvah or his commandments, this is my own abbreviation, commandments, geboeie, or if we can just say Torah, Torah is a word for the principles that we find in the word of God, has now become my new master. Because he is the commandments. He is Torah. He is mitzvah. But it spells out to me what this relationship consists of. What are the principles by which he wants to rule my way of thinking, my way of looking at life, my way of looking at experiences, my way of looking at circumstances and events and feelings. And then, Leviathan or Lucifer 
the enemy, the transgressor, the deceiver comes out and is revealed through the word of God in many names, refer referring to his character. We get Le Leviathan, we get Lucifer, we get the dragon, we get the demons, we get spirits, we get serpents, we get scorpions. All of that are the effects of being in me, being in rebellion within this space and time that we are living in. And what must be remembered and clearly understood is Leviathan or Lucifer or whatever are created beings. They are not independent, self-sufficient, and sovereign. Last week we had a look at scriptures revealing to us that Leviathan and Lucifer are created beings. They are in subjection to the sovereignty of His Majesty, the Lord Jehovah Yeshua Moshiach, the Lord God. They are not independent. And we've been dealing with Psalm 91, and we've been dealing uh, with Psalm 46. In front of Psalm 46, I think it was verse 10, we stood still, we stood still there, uh, still at that verse uh, last week and the week before, I think. And I'm going to use that same scripture today as well, where the scripture says, Be still and know, experience, know, be still, get off the throne, get your emotions and everything to be still in, in subjection, in worship at his feet, and know, experience that I am God. Have the individual inner experience. And the scripture continues and he says, I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Then the scripture continues and he says, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Those are the two last verses in Psalm 46. But there he says, He is the Lord of hosts. The year of the Lear Skara. And then he refers to, he says, The Lord of hosts is. God with his armies. His legions of warriors, angelic warriors, is with you now. The God of Jacob, he says, is, means now, your refuge, or isn't he? He is your refuge, and he is my refuge. We need to hide in him. And I've elaborated on what that means when we studied Psalm 91, and when we uh, studied some of the verses in Psalm 46. When we say he is the Lord of hosts, and then he refers to the God of Jacob, he specifically refers to the instance of Ma-Naim. Ma-Naim. Which you'll find in Genesis chapter 32, and Genesis chapter 28. Let's just turn to Genesis chapter 32, I wish us to be quick so that we can cover some of the study that we need to do today. Genesis 32. Here Jacob has already worked for Laban. He's on his way back uh, to where his mother and his father was. Where Esau was, 
And we read in 32, verse 1 and 2, And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. You see? The Lord of hosts. And he called the name of that place Manaim. It means the place of two hosts. Why two hosts? If you do not turn there now, but if you would turn there later on when you have time to Genesis 28, you'll see that Jacob had a dream, or let's call it an experience, at Beth El, which he then called Be uh, El Beth El, where he saw a ladder. And he saw angels ascending and descending. He saw that in a dream. Here in Genesis 32, he has a spiritual experience where God says, let me show you who is with you. The God of hosts is with you. God is present. And what is this hosts for? As we go on and as we continue and as Jacob continued with his, with his, uh, let me say race, with his journey, we always need either to humble ourselves or God allows us to be exalted, but to stay in a humble position and both ways there's spiritual battle, battles to be won. But God takes you down in experiences, in valley experiences, where you, where you experience disappointments, when you experience resistances, where you experience darknesses, as in Psalm 30, uh, 23, where he says, Yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. God, in his full capacity, as the Lord of hosts is in your midst. Doesn't matter whether he has you down or whether you are going up in your experiences, the Lord of hosts is there so that you will keep in the right position inside of you and me, in the position of submission and worship. Whether you experience pleasure or pain, whether you experience Hardship over the experience, what we call prosperity in the sense of little resistances. So yes, doesn't matter in what situation you are in. The Lord of hosts has his heavenly forces present where you are. We are talking about spiritual warfare. Our soul and our spirit is continuously engaged in the war between light and darkness, of which both light and darkness, the sovereignty and the sovereign one is the Lord Yeshua, Jehovah Yeshua. If you are wounded today as a soldier, wounded mentally, or maimed, or whether you are victorious at this moment in your spiritual battles, the message that I want to share with you is for you. Now we've used there in songs, song, uh, song of songs, let's turn there, Worklit, Song of Solomon. Solomon, before you get Isaiah, you get the Song of Solomon. Chapter 3, verse 8. We've been dealing with this verse a few, a few times uh, the last few weeks. Let me share and let us share a few principles. We are talking about spiritual warfare. We are talking about Jacob, 
What God did, God opened his eyes so that he could see who is with him. So that he would know in every practical circumstance that he's going to meet as he continues in his journey that all of the Lord of hosts, armies, is there under the command of Jehovah. Psalms chapter 3 verse 8 says, They all hold swords, being present continuous, being expert in war, meaning that whatever the war is, whether the war was on the mountains or whether the war was in the valleys, they were being experts in war. Colon, every man has his sword upon his thigh because of fear in the night. Now, we've already shared with you all of this and all of this war is about what? What are they are experts in in the war? Then he reveals what the war is about when he says, because of fear in the night. And we already shared that with you. It means, what is the night about? The night, the night is about a great, that's what it means in Hebrew, great twisting away of the light. A twisting away of the light. Do you hear it's got spiritual content? We're not talking here about material things. Right, because of fear of the night. That was what the war is about. So let's just turn to the word war. They are valiant, they are expert in war. That word war is the word, will take you eventually to the root word lachem. Expert in war. Let me spell the word war to you. War. Lachem. Uh, Lamet. Chet. En nun. Ach. Mem. What is the letter in the middle of the Torah? If you would take the Torah and you would count from this side and from the end of the Torah, you'll get to one letter which is a la Lamet. Lamet is a word for the whole alphabet. It means the whole scripture, the whole word that we have. It talks about the prince, the king sitting on the throne. It talks about the yoke of the word of God under which I must put my neck and ask Aleph, the trained Lord God of the universe and of all time and eternity to lead me and to teach me how to live this life and how to serve him. That is what the war is about. Let's just stick to the first letter so you and I can just get a glimpse of what this war is about. The war is not about your car that has been stolen. The war is not about the fact that they've been broken into your home. That's not where the war lies. The war is not about you being sick. That's not where the war lies. That's not the battlefield. We are talking about effects and circumstances. We are, the war is about you. What is going on in your mind and my mind the war is about whether you and I have our necks willingly within the yoke with Aleph, the sovereign Lord God of the universe. That word war is the word lachem. It means and it spells bread. What are you eating? Because that is what the word war means bread what are you eating what are you and i assimilating within our minds what are you feeding your mind with that's where the battle lies 
It refers to showbread. Jesus said, I think it's uh, John chapter 6, he said to them, uh, you were taught, when you were taught about the tabernacle, about the, tab the, uh, the uh, bread of show, uh, showbread on the table, he says, that showbread was a reflection of me. I am the bread. So the, lach the lachem, showbread, refers to me. I am the bread. I am the living bread. Many facet by the by the by the dung nie, by the beeld nie, kom by the werkelijkheid uit. Waarnaas praat het, waar oor praat het. So the war is about whether Yeshua, Jesus, the bread of life, the word of God, whether that is what you are assimilating, whether that is what you are eating and feeding yourself with and allowing to rule and have the rulership of your mind and your thinking patterns, your cognitive assimilations. He says, valiant, they are valiant, they are expert in war. It means they know what the war is about. Now I've met people through the years that has been in the bush war. And the moment you ask them, where were you? And they tell you the name. There many times I've said to my wife, they, don't, they haven't got a clue what the bush war was about. They hadn't been there. Certain areas, certain beacons, Certain landmarks were specific, very dangerous areas. Some people went to the bush on the bush wall and they came back tanned. Tanned and relaxed. They didn't know a clue, but they talk about the bush wall. And the same in the Christian world. We find Christians talking about the war, and they are in war, and they are devastated, and they are they are. Hulle is gedaan, man, hulle is uitgemergel, hulle is honger en moeg. And if you, if you talk about them, and you talk with them, to see where was the battleground, what is the battleground that they are so-called defending? Or like in the army in those days, that they are dominating. Then you find out, they hadn't been there. They were, they exhausted, yes. They can talk about it, yes. But they've missed the war. He says here, the valiant experts in war with their swords on their thigh. And Paul talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword is associated and identified by the word. Not what you and I say, say is the word, but by the word that is given by the spirit that is exactly what the word says. Swords on their thigh. Now, what is that word thigh? That word thigh, thigh is the word uh, yarek and uh, I've elaborated on that before. Uh, Peter uh, talks about um, bind up the loins of your mind. It's the same word. It is the word kaf. Right. It refers to this portion. He says, where must the swords be? They must be at and be ready there at your uh, thought life, your imagination, where you produce and where you manufacture all your, your plans and your images. That is the battlefield. Okay, he says there, the swords on the thigh because of the fear of the night. What is the cause? What is the enemy? It is fear. Fear that 
comes with twisted truth. And that is what makes this war so subtle and very dangerous. It is a subtle war. So what we need, because it says it is because of a great twisting away of the light. And there is a great twisting away of light in the world and in the religious world. I don't need to tell you about it. And therefore we need to read and study trustworthy war reports. Last week I took you to a specific war report that Paul was giving. And we need to read war reports so that you can know what the war is about that you are in. What is the war? We've just said, devouring bread while there is resistances, obstacles in your way. That is the war. Now what is the essence of any war? The essence of war. What do we find? We find, let me just stick to my notes here, we find intelligence, intelligence. With that, to, with that we can add a battle plan. Battle plan. The second thing, we find trained and fit and therefore informed informed warriors or soldiers none of these elements can you take out of the war in which we are. Then we find that war is about resources. We cannot get away of any of these very, very three in absolutely uh, uh, focus important points. Intelligence, we've been talking about intelligence. We are talking about a battle plan. And we're talking about trained, fit, and informed warriors. If you had been on a war, a soldier is not just basically informed. Just basically. No. If you do that, you send them into death. They become cannon feed, cannon fodder. In some wars they have done that. They send in a quite a few very energetic, very optimistic soldiers that they've put on, uh, they've, put, uh, they've given them uniforms and weapons. And they send them in. There had been wars like that, with millions of casualties and millions of graves. That seems to me many times with the Christian churches today. And the war is about resources. Resources is not your material possessions. The resources is not your or my job securities. The resources is not your or my purses and how much money you have and how grand car you are driving and how safe your car and my car and our homes are. That's not what the Bible talks when it talks about resources. What is the war about? War is about resources. 
And when we talk about resources, if the Word of God talks about resources, He talks about your soul, He talks about your mind, He talks about your will, He talks about eternal destination. The Bible and the spiritual world doesn't discern and doesn't formulate in their battle plan your material prosperity and your material possessions as the real resource. Yes, they use those things to get to you who is the real resource. I think I need to repeat to you what is intelligence. And intelligence, according to the Word of God, doesn't talk about IQ. We're not talking about IQ. Because if we talk about IQ, I will not be even standing in the queue. We're talking about IQ. No, we're not talking about IQ. We are talking about what the Bible sees and what God sees as IQ or intelligence. And we're talking about intelligence in the sense of of war information. What intelligence information do you need? Even at the start and during this war that you are in. Intelligence is spelt Aleph Va and Taf. Aleph Sorry, it's a sprung on. This is a, a, an ox. <laughs> Should I write there? Ox. A va and a taf. Without this intelligence information, you are part of those type of wars we are sent into to show the real warriors where's the landmines, and where is all the underlaw? It's underlaw. Ambush. Where all the ambushments where they are. So for you not to be part of a statistic, of a war statistic. You and I need not to know. When we talk about know, in biblical terms, we're not talking about knowledge. We're talking about experiencing what you know. What you need and I need to know, the intelligence information that we need to know, is that He is sovereign. And as I would say so many times and so often and continuously, because I get these revelations continuously of what sovereignty is about, we do not realize what sovereignty is about. He is sovereign. And His sovereignty has got no beginning and no end. And within His sovereignty, there are we. So, the, the intelligence information that I need to know in this battle is that He is sovereign. Things do not just happen per chance with you. It's not a toeval and toevallig and high weet jy amper dit and amper dit nie. God is sovereign. Okay. And here are, here is me. The Va talks about six, man was created on the sixth day, talk about creation, talks about many things. Va talks about the, the gospel. Do you see here? The gospel, the true gospel, has got all of these main principles that you and I must be taught 
and must walk in to be able to even say that I have and I'm walking in the gospel. Then we get taught how the spiritual walk is about. How this information of the gospel continues. How this experience continues. Then it continues into the promises and the warnings. The gospel is not about the promises. There are many things that are involved. Principles. So with a VAR, you and me, talking about you and me, I need from the, from, from, uh, from the front and from the back, like a sandwich, I need to walk in this battlefield among two main principles. And he is the principle, which is his sovereignty and the covenant. The covenant. That is the sign of the covenant. The covenant is the berit. The berit. The berit covenant. The sign of the covenant. If I forget about the covenant, and I just remember his sovereignty, I'm a goner. I'm depressed. I've got no hope. If I forget about his sovereignty, and I just think about the cross, I'm a goner as well. I need to know that he is sovereign. His kingdom goes beyond time and space, beyond where I am. Like in my testimony, when I bent my knees before him after facing death myself in circumstances, in war, I bent my knees and I said, I know that you are. You must reveal yourself to me. He didn't find living Jesus and that and that and that and abusing that name. I'm fed up with that. Because he is the sovereignty of everlasting. Berit. There is blood for me. There is a way out. God never oversees sin. He doesn't oversee your sin. Your sin, every sin, every portion of sin needs to be judged. And that is what he done on the cross. So in this covenant, this covenant says, I cannot, but he can. I will never be able to make it. I will never be able to bow in true reality inside of me and my, my uh, reason to be changed. If he wasn't sovereign and he couldn't work it in me. Because I do not have it. I don't have what it takes. He has what it takes. So this battle has been raging and going on for eons of time. There was a beginning of time. Cosmology will teach you. I can, I can teach you. I know that. I know the scientific and the physical, the physics, according to the, the most high-ranked cosmologists, of which one of them was The man that died last year? Hawking. Even he acknowledged there was a beginning of time. Right. Now, the battle or the war had been going on for eons of time since Genesis. We read about Ezekiel 28. We read Isaiah 14. And then, as I said, there are many war reports that specifically reports and details and maps out this war in which we are in. So the battleground is heaven and earth. Your mind, if we study about our mind, our mind is a supercomputer. We have software 
and we have network, military software, military network, that the enemy tries to hack into. If he's hacked into your, your software, you're a goner. The war is finished. Then you are another statistic. This supercomputer that we have, this, how many kilograms of fat? Who can help me? I think it's two, two kilograms of fat. Which no man can tell you why, how does thinking take place? Why are those electrical um, impulses, the, that in, uh, electrical uh, uh, sparks, where do they come from? What do they cause? They cause thinking, yes. One of the philosophers said, I am a man because I think. Everything that thinks, we're talking about you. Anybody here that's not thinking? If you're thinking and not thinking, then I don't need to talk to you anymore. All right. But we have this black box called your mind. It works like the black box, or let's say the black box in an airplane that they so many times refer to, works on the basic principles of a man's mind. If they want to know what has happened with this plane, and they can recover the black box, and they replay it, then they know. Your mind is a black box, which will one day be played before the throne of the Most High. What are you doing, and what do you allow, and what synaps synopsis in Afrikaans do you allow as you sit here and those sparks go off because you are thinking God has given us his commandments so that we can direct our direction of thinking and our way of thinking do not hold on to your old ways of thinking. The battle and the war is not about you. It's about the Lord God, Yeshua, Moshiach, and Leviathan. Why have you become the battlefield? And the resource that we were referring to here. Firstly, we can turn to Genesis. Let's start at the beginning. Perashit, the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and verse 27 will tell you that man... You were created and I was created in the image and the likeness of God. Whether man likes it or not, he is an image and a likeness of God. And therefore, one of the, that's one of the main, one of the reasons that Lucifer hates you. He wants to destroy and mar the image and the likeness that you represent. And then in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, we see here that God breathed into your nostrils and into man's nostrils the breath of life. That word breathed into us, the breath of life is, that breath is neshama. Neshama. And man became a living soul, nefesh, or nefesh. What is the facility? And when I talk about noshama, and when I talk about nefesh, we are talking about facilities that we need to study to know what it means. What is nefesh of nefesh? It's one of the, one of the, one of the facilities of nefesh or nefesh is so, so that you and I can make choices. You have got 
man was made with the capacity and with the power of choices. What is neshama? Neshama is a breath. It talks about feelings. So because you and I have got the breath of God in us, we've got feelings. Printernet, you have to feel it, you have Right. You and my gevoelens hang af van wat ons met die nefes doen, wat ons kies. Right. Then God gave, you can read it at home, to save time, you can read it at home, you must read it at home, you must check. Truth is always, will stand examination. Then what God, what did he then do? So let's say here, Nefesh, feel, choice, choice with the seer, choice, the third thing that happened, God gave certain commandments. My abbreviation. Gom commandments was given from the moment that man was created because commandments. Is what gives light. I'll give you the verse now. Commandments. Alongside with the Torah brings brings a lamp and a light. That implies that there is darkness. We'll get to the scripture now. But what is the commandments that God gives? The commandments that God gives All right? He says, eat freely. The religious world these days says, says, don't eat too much. A Sunday service and bringing the word of God shouldn't be more than half an hour, 20 minutes. Don't eat much. Please don't eat freely. Don't read your Bible at home and don't study at home. Get as little as possible. You see, that's because it, the battle lies at your mind. Eat freely. Eat freely what? Eat freely of every tree. And of the tree of life. I cannot substantiate now at this moment everything for you, but when he talks about eat freely and eat of the tree of life, he refers to the commandments and he refers to Torah. Torah was present there, the principles of God was present, as I previous in previous uh, weeks, maybe months, I gave you the scripture where a, the word of God says, Abram followed the commandments. Although the commandments was only given in scripture or in writing at 50 days after Israel left Egypt. A few hundred years after Abraham. Eat freely. Then dress the garden. Then keep the garden. We are talking about spiritual warfare. We are talking about why Christians, I nearly want to say most of the times as we speak to Christians we find most of the times Christians are actually or mostly maimed through this war, wounded in their minds and heads and limping. Some of them are dragging themselves around
2 verse 9 says there, And God, uh, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Hebrew word for that word, mitz, or let me first draw the garden. When it refers to the word garden, uh, where did I write it down? The word garden means gun. Gemel, nun. Gun. The garden means hedge about. And protect and defend. So Adam, male and female, or Adam and his wife, the woman, was put into a place where God said to them, this is a place that is hedged about to protect and to defend, implying there's an enemy. Hebrew scholars says the garden refers to a four square garden. By principle, we know it's a four square garden because we learn about the New Jerusalem that is four square and that we must be prepared to enter into the New Jerusalem. When we learn about the Malkut kingdom, where Jesus refers to the kingdom of God, is like a, a field, it refers to a four square field. When God said to the Hebrew, what's uh, 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 the uh, farmers to plow, he said to them, plow and plant in a square. So we see the principle here. Yud, hey, vo, hey. So here we see in the midst. In the midst. What do we find in the midst? In the midst we find a tree If you would continue, if you would read it at home more, a tree in the midst. In the midst we find two trees. Is that right? In the midst. Both trees are in the midst. With a tree of life, I just draw a cross there to show the tree of life. The tree of life in the midst of the tree of knowledge. If you can just, in your mind's eye, see a, a scale here of good and evil. Therefore, in the midst of good and evil, Eat the true life. Eat the tree of life. Don't get involved with the good and with the evil. Focus, Adam. Focus on the life in the midst of it. Eat of the tree of life. What do what does some and most doctrines teach uh, Christians these days is identify the tree of good and evil and 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 uh, get involved with the tree of good and evil. And uh, the tree of life is not here. The tree of life is there. Refuse all of this and keep yourself busy with this. With the knowledge. The Christian message is, and the biblical message is, what God said exactly to Adam, male and female, he said, eat of the tree of life. Eat of the tree of life. If you eat of the tree of life, he said, 
per implication, if you eat of the tree of life, you know good and evil will make sense. But that's not the issue. The issue is the tree of life. Many years ago, some people, somebody reminded me this week, I shared with people here an old Chinese pictographic alphabet. An old Chinese pictographic alphabet. The ancient Chinese in their first dynasties knew the Lord God, according to their historical information. And the old Chinese pictographic alphabet, the letter that refers and the word that refers to garden refers to a four-square garden. That's just interesting. And many, many other things. Right. So, who is the garden? The garden is your mind. Because it is you. You are a human being because you think. You are because you think. In the Song of Solomon, you and I are explained, and we've done, I've, we've done a, few, a few times, the study from every, ver, every word in the Song of Solomon I've given studies on. Every word. So, in the Song of Solomon, you and I are depicted as a garden, in which God wants to hedge about and in which, God, in which God wants to work on you and me, de-weed us, and build a tower in the midst, tower of his name, I'm not a drawer. You can picture the four square. If I put it on the side, you can see the tower. Okay. Yes, and even the parables that Jesus uses to explain to us what he's talking about when he says that he wants to build his kingdom inside of us so that we can have a picture and think because we think in pictures. Every tree eat freely of every tree. Here we have every tree, this Torah, or the Word of God, or Yeshua, consists of many, many testimonies. The different trees with a different fruit, everything speaks about the Creator. Every tree, not just the New Testament, not just focusing on certain things that suits me, but focusing on the full Word of God. The tree of life, what's in my time? All right. We should just stop at the strategic point. Let me just see here, because we have to have a short Bible study this morning, because of certain requests that was made. Let's just go to the scripture and then we can from uh, next week we can use this as a as a starting point but just close off I've seen in my life and I know you have seen that knowledge kills people 
I had very dear friends at, uni on, at university. We got saved. And some of them went to study theology because they got saved. Now, I begged them not to do that. And I've met some of them. My wife and I met, met one of them, can't remember, let's say eight years ago. As dead as a doornail. Of God and God being alive, there's nothing left. And as I've seen, I've seen, I'm in the ministry for 35 years. I've seen many people in the ministry die, killed because of their knowledge. Because of knowledge, the wrong knowledge. Because they started to focus on eating the knowledge, not seeing the tree of life in the midst of it, not focusing on the tree of life, but eating the tree of knowledge and getting into the battle of good and evil and good and evil and good and evil and missing the life in the midst of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Turn with me there. In closing. There's a fly trying to get to my mind. And I refuse my mind to be controlled by a fly and the effects of that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Not being a letter of the Torah, not being, uh, not, uh, 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 not the letter, not the Torah, not knowledge of the Hebrew, not theology, not understanding the gospel with your mind. But he says, serving the Lord, understanding, finding the tree of life in the midst of it. Not eating of the tree of knowledge, but eating of the tree of life. And this seems to be very, very simple, but it's very intricate, and it involves you and me daily, where we miss to eat of the tree of life in the midst of our obstacles and in the midst of our tribulations and persecutions. We start getting involved with the good and the, uh, the good and the evil and getting that battle instead of focusing on the tree of life. Eat the tree of life in the midst of the good and the evil and you will experience life. Because the enemy likes you. As he did with Adam, male and female, we get to that sometime maybe uh, next week. What Adam, what, what the serpent knew, he knew if he could just there get Adam and his wife to get them, get their focus off so they get involved with the tree of knowledge. Then he knows. Then he knew he would have them. They could just get their focus off. What did Jesus say there in John? Just turn with me to John chapter 5. We see this principle played in front of our eyes over and over and over and over. I've met pastors which I, after talking to them I would say, why is this guy a pastor? Where's the life? Where's the relationship? Why is he so involved with the tree of knowledge and the tree of good and evil? And he's busy with that. And what I find is I do not find life. John chapter 5 verse 37 and 40 says here, And the Father himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me 
He's talking here to the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the theologians, and he says, Ye have neither heard the voice at any time or seeth his shape. He says to those that were studying the scripture that knows the Hebrew and everything much better than us. And that we find so often, people knowing the Hebrew, knowing the Greek, knowing the background, knowing everything, exactly how it sticks together. I can tell you, I personally can tell you about many designs, patterns, mathematical patterns, uh, Bible codes, we don't need certain uh, uh, things, you just need a computer and going into the, the, the value of the letters and see the absolutely divine, supernatural hand of God in the midst of it. And you can get so involved with those studies that, we are, that I understand here that Jesus says, you haven't heard his voice. You must hear his voice. Not his words, not his voice. Leonora, jy sal baie goed weet as die foon lei en as jou pa op die foon. Of iemand wat, as iemand die woorde van jou pa gebruik waarmee jou geadresseer het, gaan jy jou nie vang nie. Want jy gaan nie stem, sal jy merk jy. His voice. Nie die visie nie syp. You do not recognize him in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your tribulations. You do not see him. He says, and ye have not, uh, and ye have not his word abiding in you. Yes, they can recite the Torah. Five books. All five books of the Bible they could recite. So he's referring here to the life in the word. You have not his word abiding in you for whom he hath sent, uh, uh, for whom he hath sent him. Ye believe not? He says, here I stand. I am the living word. You study the word, but you do not see me. Searching the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and there are, and they are they, which testify of me. Hidden. In the midst of the garden. Hidden. That's why I specifically drew the tree of knowledge of good and evil, very visible. In the midst of it, you'll find the tree of life. Hidden. Here I stand in front of you. You can see my outline. In the midst of this is life. Running up and down. To and fro inside of me. You cannot see that. In the midst of the tree of knowledge of good and evil runs the tree of life. Find him. That's why we need to seek him. We see the serpent, the moment he got the focus away from the tree of life onto the tree of knowledge, the war was won. Next week, Lord willing, we will continue from here. I actually prepared, I thought yesterday, yeah, I'll have to really to negotiate to see whether I can't get past an hour and a half. Lord, you are the eternal, everlasting word. And we stand before you as the source of our existence. The very source of who and what our minds are. You are the owner of our minds, of our soul. 
You are the one that knows exactly how this supercomputer works. And you know exactly that when our soul, when our mind falls in the wrong hands, we are condemned and destroyed. And therefore we pray, Lord God, that you will work in our hearts and in our minds, that we will focus and put our focus where you said we need to focus, that we will eat freely of your word with a tree of life in the midst of it, so that we may experience being expert in war with our swords upon our thigh fighting and warring the twisting away of the light in Jesus name Amen